Good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. You're most welcome to this event, uh, a commemorative event to mark St. Bridget's Day. Uh, my name is Dr. Dara Gannon. I am lecturer in Irish Studies, uh, Vice President of the Global Irish Diaspora Congress, and joint editor with Fergal McGarry of a new RIA publication, Ireland 1922, Independence, Partition and Civil War. Now, this event is jointly organised by the Royal Irish Academy uh, in collaboration with the Department of Foreign Affairs to mark St. Bridget's Day. And I'm delighted to be joined by three of the contributors to Ireland 1922 who can speak with expertise to issues relating to women, gender and the decade of centenaries, not only in terms of Ireland 1922, but also the decade of commemorations more broadly. So it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome each of our contributors in turn. Lindsay Erner Byrne holds the Chair of Irish Gender History at University College Cork. She has published on our social, uh, gender and welfare history with an emphasis on intersections between policy and lived experience. Um, her most recent book, which is co-authored with Diane Urquhart, explores the history of abortion, focusing on differences and commonalities of experience on the island of Ireland. And that is entitled The Abortion Journey 1920 to 2018 and published by Cambridge University Press in 2019. Lindsay, you're very welcome. Miriam McAuliffe, our second guest, is a historian and assistant professor in gender studies at UCD. And uh, she is currently researching and writing on gendered and sexual violence during the Irish Revolutionary Period to be published later in 2022. And her most recent publication is a biography of the Scottish born Irish revolutionary and feminist Margaret Skinner, published with UCD Press in 2020. And Mary, you're also very welcome to join us. And lastly, uh, but not least, I'm delighted to be joined by Fanula Walsh, who is Assistant Professor of Modern Irish History at University College Dublin. And she completed her PhD and Irish Research Council postdoctoral fellowship at Trinity College Dublin. And um, she's also Secretary of the Women's History Association of Ireland. And her first monograph, which is entitled Irish Women and the Great War, was published by Cambridge University Press in 2020. And I should note that it was recently rece received the NUI Publication Prize in Irish History. So again, very welcome, Fanula, and congratulations on your success. So uh, I'd like to open the floor really in terms of our contributors and we are going to focus initially on those um, essays which you have contributed to Ireland 1922 and we'll, we'll explore each of those essays in turn because as the book tries to emphasize, we're offering new perspectives on a, a, a very important year and milestone year in the formation of the Irish state. But hopefully these essays, 50 essays, uh, which, which mark new areas of research will offer new perspectives on, on that period. Um, so Lindsay, if I may begin with you, we're, we're kind of going through the volume in, in order. Um, you've touched on the theme of gender and poverty in the new uh, free state. Can you speak to us about why that's important and what you discovered in your research? Yep, thanks, Dara. Um, well, just first to say that the way the book is organised um, is what was what kind of spurred me to do that, because we were asked to pick a day in the year 1922 and to tell a story that spoke to, you know, our research or something that we thought was important about that year. And I just thought it was such an innovative idea. And it has, I think, resulted in a volume that's really manageable, that sort of takes you through the year. You can delve in really deeply or you can just read, you know, you can decide to do March, which is the month that, that I chose. Um, and I suppose... I was asked to kind of think about the the ordinary experience and and to what degree were people's lives changed or are or, or not changed by that year, um, and I chose a, a very ordinary letter written by a, a mother of of several children to the Catholic Archbishop of Dublin in March 1922, effectively looking for help um, on, on various levels. She doesn't actually specify what she wants. She tells him about her marriage and how difficult it is to feed her children. And what, what I liked about the letter was it was indicative of the thousands of other letters sent during that period that never mentioned the violence of 1922, that barely made reference to this momentous political uh, energy that surrounded them. Um, and, and I think that's probably something that gets lost sometimes in commemoration because the focus is so much on the big dates and we think that everybody was as, as fascinated by it as we are in, in hindsight. Um, but for a lot of people and certainly people like uh, those that would have written seeking assistance, uh, particularly financial assistance to various charities and churches, 
their their experience was really not changed that much. Um, and in fact, she she says things have got worse, if anything, for her. So so that's where I was coming from with the letter. Uh, it's it's actual it's banality, if you like. It's it's sort of everydayness is what what really interested me, and that's what I loved about the collection, the idea of the collection that it gave scope for an essay like mine to be beside somebody like Mary's, uh, uh, which is really traumatic, and in, in which a day for a woman in the same year transforms everything. I think your essay is so powerful and, 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 and you know, the idea of a single letter evoking, uh, you know, the silence in many respects that these women, but the poverty of these women that they've been treated with in terms of Irish history. Um, and, and I thought you made a very, very telling uh, conclusion when you say power is always measured in pounds and pence. And I thought that was so insightful as to how, you know, those who have a voice and those who are, who are voiceless in terms of Irish history. Um, and, and, and the false promise of political independence. Could you speak a little bit about that, this idea of the false promise? And I suppose from a social history point of view, do you see that as, you know, there in 1922 or is that a later legacy of, of 1922? You know what's really interesting, Dara, if you'd asked me that before I looked at this particular collection of letters to the Archbishop of Dublin, um, those letters were written between 1920 and 1940, so covering those early decades of independence, I would have said to you, surely that was the gift of hindsight. You know, surely people came to see in the 30s what the Free State had done or failed to do. But in fact, these people who were living on the margins and really, you know, literally living from crust to crust, from pawn to pawn ticket, were acutely aware um, of what the promise of independence did and didn't hold for them. And in fact, it's not retrospect, retrospective wisdom, if you like. Uh, they were, they were that the, the kind of depth of their observation, the acuity of their knowledge is breathtaking. And even this woman is typical too of many of the other writers in that she had a fairly tenuous grasp on literacy. So the spelling wasn't great, punctuation wasn't great, but my goodness, she's so articulate. I mean, she's so insightful and she can just put her finger on it. And she's well aware that, you know, as one of the other women who wrote in at the time said, what, who cares what, what religion you are once you have a crust of bread to eat. So they were fully aware that the power masters, if you like might change but this but their their chances of having a fair and equal life wouldn't when i talk about the promise of um of independence as a false dawn i mean it is something i happen to think is is true for many people but actually that is a sentiment she expresses or rather one she says her husband expressed so there is a line in the letter where she says i'll, I'll just see if i can find it now um where she says he said this is supposed to be the ireland of free irish men and look what it's brought me, nothing. And um, so there was a sense, and which is very, if you read Sean of Casey's plays, you can see where he got those. They, these were not caricatures, like these were exactly the way people were expressing themselves. And that she relays that to the archbishop, that she's, that's the only inference in the letter that this, uh, that, that it's been written during a time when Ireland is, is, is acquiring uh, some form of in political independence. And it's a reference of disappointment that she sort of ventriloquizes for her husband. And you can almost see him say it like, um, you know, because he's on strike at the time. And he's saying, so this is this is exactly where it's got me, exactly nowhere. Um, and, and she does talk about, I thought the Catholics were supposed to be better, which I think is shorthand for Irish rulers. So, so in some senses, it's not the gift of hindsight. It is very much a narrative if there's any narrative, it's a narrative that, that that many of these writers themselves are placing on events. That's absolutely fascinating. I think it's really important what you allude to about, you know, to decode those kind of primary sources uh, and to try and you know, read, you know, um, kind of analysis through their in their own language, in their own times and in their own terms. And again, the kind of privileged sources which we usually, you know, turn to political history, history from above, um, doesn't necessarily allow for that. And, and with that, I'd like to turn to you, Mary, um, in terms of your essay, which focuses on gendered violence against women. And, and I know you speak to this idea of, you know, rereading sources, which perhaps scholars in the past would have overlooked and rereading them through the lens of, of gender history. Yes, so, um, and, and again, I, I want to echo what Lindsay said, I think this is a fabulous publication and I've been dipping in and out of it and the different essays are bringing out so many different aspects of 1922 or indeed the whole revolutionary period and beyond. Um, and congratulations to yourself and Fergal for producing such a, a wonderful collection and the publishers for a beautiful volume. 
Um, so my essay was on uh, an incident that happened on uh, 22nd of May 1922 in County Tyrone, in Dun just outside Dungannon, when uh, the Cullen household was invaded by a group of men, um, probably uh, B-specials or, or uh, RUC constables. Um, and Mary Cullen, the mother, and her two daughters were forcibly haircropped and her son was beaten up. And I think it is telling immediately what happens to uh, the men and women in the house. The son is beaten up and he's badly beaten up and badly assaulted. But the two women are both beaten up, or the three women are both beaten up and have their hair cropped off. Um, we know about this because they sue for compensation. And so it comes to a um, uh, court of inquiry, court case, uh, and the reporting of that is in the newspapers. And this is very similar uh, and different to what the research I've been doing on the War of Independence. And one would presume a lot of this type of violence would stop with the truce or later into 1921. And I had presumed that in some ways they might be isolated incidents. But actually, if you look at the newspaper reports, if you look at um, RIC uh, reports, if you look at um, different archives, you can see that the hair cropping has stopped in places where it was ongoing during the War of Independence, which would have been in Munster uh, and a bit in Dublin and up the West Coast, uh, Clare and Galway, a bit in Sligo and Donegal. And now it's happening in the Northern Counties. Uh, where it had not been happening really uh, to much effect, a little bit in Donegal prior to 1922. Uh, and this wasn't the only incidence of hair cropping from January until December 1922. Uh, I have um, quite a number of incidences of hair cropping by B-specials, by orange men, these are the, how they're reported in the newspapers, by Sinn Feiners, by Republicans. So again, it's women caught in the middle of a war between different groups of men. Um, and so uh, a couple of days after the attack on the Cullen household uh, in another townland outside uh, Dungannon, Mrs. Dennison, who was the wife of an R um, RIC constable, Sergeant Dennison, was attacked in her own home because uh, they had flown the flag, the Union Jack, on Empire Day earlier in uh, May. <clears throat> and so it's Republicans who are attacking her. And then a few days later, another incident happens. And this continues. So um, for example, I have then, I just found the other day, uh, a Ruth Beaumont was attacked in Donegal in February 1922 because she was an Englishwoman. And so anti-treaty IRA attack her and forcibly hair crop her. And one interesting thing that is coming through in the reporting as well is that in Belfast in the summer, uh, May to April, May, June and July of 1922, when there's a lot of violence, um, you find that women are being attacked in their homes by parties of men and we don't know who they are. The house is being robbed but the women are being forcibly hair cropped as well. It seems to be part of, of robberies now but if this is uh, Protestants on Catholic households or Catholic on Protestant households there is uh, not much information about it and so are we seeing a sort of um, bleeding of this uh, forcible hair cropping as a weapon of war into as a weapon of criminality? Uh, in Belfast in 1922. So it's very interesting to look at that. And of course, sexual violence continues as well. In 1922, there's quite a number of, of, of horrible gang rapes in both the North and the South and the West of the country. Uh, but forcible hair cropping is, is still very much part of, of the violence that's going on uh, throughout 1922. Um, and I think it has, again, um, you know, change the way we, we look at the revolutionary period. We have to in, include the uh, experiences of women, both as um, active agents, as militants, as anti-treaty women, and they're attacked. And I have, uh, I, I found recently a um, an, um, source in the uh, military archives where a woman was attacked by a National Army soldier from the language. And again, Lindsay, in your article on the rape of Mary M., um, that the language is obtuse, it's hard to tell, but from the language there is a suggestion certainly of sexual harassment, maybe sexual abuse. And in he, the soldier in defending himself, says, well, she's nothing but a Republican bitch. So that language of, of women's um, agency is used to attack them during 1922 and on into 1923. But you also have the experience of civilian women. They're attacked just because they're 
uh, Catholic, just because they're related to Republican activists, just because their family might be anti-treaty. Um, and this is ongoing and it will continue on into the Irish Free States where rates of violence against women, domestic violence, public violence, sexual violence are quite high from the research we know so far. Um, and, you know, uh, Lindsay talking about her, her, her letter, and, and that is a powerful article to show the ordinary experience. Do these women, particularly the militant women, expect that violence to stop once the uh, war was over? Perhaps they did, but it certainly didn't. And you can see them campaigning about violence against women, as we still are to this day, unfortunately, as proved uh, only earlier this month. That's absolutely correct. And then, of course, the contemporary relevance of issues of violence against women, you know, resonate very powerfully, as you mentioned, and we hope to come back to that later in the discussion. I just want to circle back, uh, Mary, to, and I find that this is very interesting in relation to the issue of partition, because, of course, I suppose, really, partition having been established in 1921, formally, we do have histories which tend to focus then on the 26 county state and the six county state, whereas, you know, as your work suggests, it's so important to look at the island as a unit in terms of those um, patterns of, of, of violence towards women. And speaking of patterns, I mean, you readily identified in your essay the fact that historians traditionally, um, certainly of the traditional school of thought, um, kind of suggested that there were low levels or low incidents of, of sexual violence during this period. Can you speak to that a little bit in terms of why do you think the early historiography um, did not explore this issue and, and how has that been rectified in, in your own research and in more recent decades? Well, of course, the, the um, I, I think, um, beginning of this research was really from, from um, Louise Ryan's groundbreaking article, Drunken Tans, uh, which was published in, in 2000. And so for the last 20 years, historians have been talking about this more and more and more. But I think there was always a um, refusal or, or, or reticence to accept that forcible hair cropping is on a continuum of sexual violence. And I see it as on a continuum of sexual violence. Um, it is about shaming women. It is about stigmatizing women. It is about attacking their body, cropping their hair. Um, a lot of the um, IRA men who talk about their activities in hair cropping women mention that it, it, donates, it denotes the type of lifestyle that girl was living if they were hair cropped for company keeping. So it is an implication that it's something to do with femininity, um, um, deviant femininity, deviant sexuality. Uh, and I think we have to see it as on a continuum of sexual violence against women. So if we see that, then then the Irish War of Independence and Civil War has a lot of sexual violence uh, against women um, and, and the forcible hair cropping is the majority of the type of, of that type of violence that's done against women. Rape and sexual assault is less, um, but how much less can we say? Because of course, who are they reporting this to? They're not going to be reporting it to the RIC or indeed the RUC. I mean, we know that reporting rates are low in the 21st century. Uh, in the uh, 1919 to 1923 period, it's not going to be very high either. Also, there is that reticence of the use of language, um, outrage, indignity, assault. If you look at the newspapers, you can use criminal assault uh, and various other types of ways of, des of describing how women are assaulted. And in using, in, in, uh, using those uh, key, key words to look through the newspaper reports, I have come up with quite an, uh, a lot more assaults that I would suggest are actually sexual assaults that are being done on women by soldiers, by Republicans. I have found some uh, a number of cases where the Republican police during the War of Independence are actually dealing with their own members committing criminal assault on women. Uh, and the way they deal with it is, is really to move them around the place, you know, the Catholic Church, uh, uh, set the, did not set the pattern on that, you know, so uh, we see that happening. Uh, where we see sexual assault reported, it is reported in the newspapers. So I think uh, uh, along with the fact that this is happening, the reporting of it creates an uh, atmosphere of fear. Um, when I was researching Amelia Wilmot, a woman who worked in the RIC station in Listowel in County Kerry uh, and brought out arms and ammunition and information for the IRA, um, she was talking about the fact that uh, the women did not go up the side of the building because they knew that's where the women, uh, girls and women would be attacked. 
So if they went to the barracks for any reason, you were told not to go up the side of the building because that's where the black and tans, always referred to as black and tans, would assault women. So women knew where not to go. Meg Connery talks about how after curfew hours, women knew not to go outside. Uh, so there is this fear and the fear cannot be baseless. Uh, so if we look at the records, I think we, look, we need to look at the language, we need to look at uh, the, uh, what they, the uh, archives are telling us, and we need to look more deeply into the newspaper reports, the court of inquiries, um, and various other um, sources. And I think with doing that, I know with doing that because I've been doing that research, we have, a, uh, we have no clean war between 1919 and 1923. We do have uh, gendered and sexual violence against women. And, and that continuum is, is, you know, this is kind of groundbreaking uh, research, which, which you and others are doing uh, in terms of Irish historiography, and I think will make an impact, certainly internationally. I mean, Peter Hart once famously stated the Irish Revolution was the best documented revolution in the world. And I think only really now through your research and the research uh, of Linda Connolly and others, we're, we're finally kind of getting to the nuances of that extant record, which I think will certainly um, bear, uh, you know, yeah. bear remarkable results in, in the coming months and years. I, I want to kind of move on as well to Fanula's research. And, and it's actually quite interesting, uh, Mary talked about, you know, the, the kind of the, the newspaper reports. Fanula, you've looked at a specific newspaper report uh, in terms of your essay, which focuses on um, ordinary life and extraordinary times, as you so aptly put it. And I think it's a beautiful illustration which you've chosen from the Irish Independent. Uh, you know, it certainly highlights the, the importance of visual culture to the volume. Could you speak a little bit about the idea of the mundane and the traumatic? Yeah, uh, thanks very much, and um, um, it's really it was a great pleasure to have a chapter in this in this wonderful volume. I think one of the things that sort of drew me to the volume was the fact that it ranges from the global to the national to the local, from big picture, momentous, you know, political events, days that we remember for for centuries later, um, and then quite ordinary, mundane, um, domestic sort of days. Um, and so what I focused on was the, the reopening of Cleary's department store in August 1922, which doesn't really seem perhaps like a topic, um, an event that merits um, a chapter of its own. Um, and yet for me, this was the chance to just explore you know, the continuities of ordinary life at that time, um, you know, what was possible, um, the sort of mix of the, the mundane um, in the midst of civil war. And Cleary's I thought was quite interesting in this respect because, of course, the store had been destroyed in the 1916 Rising. And so, um, you know, this was a place that had a really important place that in the Dublin popular uh, imagination um, had been destroyed, um, had been, you know, people had to go to um, a temporary premises to get their, their ribbons, their hats, <laughs> millinery um, during that time. And then 1922, grand reopening, um, beautiful um, advertisements um, in the press, you know, great fanfare, a band there for the first day, a priest to come give a blessing. Um, this was, you know, quite momentous um, for the shoppers of Dublin um, at that time. And, you know, at a conference in Dublin Castle last weekend, um, or sorry, two weekends ago, um, Anne Dolan spoke about the importance of hope in January 1922 and the sense of optimism and looking ahead to the future um, for people then. And I think, in a sense, you know, something small like now um, this reopening, in a sense, you know, is looking ahead. It's using compensation money given by the British government to, to rebuild it. And, you know, the advertisements speak about modernity. It's all about the electric um, passenger lifts, the internal telephone system, but also talking about the um, fire resistant glass, um, you know, the sprinkler system. So, you know, a sense of, you know, of what they've survived um, to rebuild and to move on. Um, and so, you know, this in itself, it's something, something small, but it represents, you know, these sort of the new, you know, what's, what's ahead. Um, a sort of sense of security and hope in, in what's, what's coming. But of course, this is August 1922. So reports of the reopening of Cleary's jostled for space with reports of irregular activities around the country, you know, photo, photographs of army troops, you know, incidents, um, um, you know, documentation about the, the Battle of Dublin. Um, we only, only shortly concluded where other um, buildings on O'Connell Street have been, have been destroyed. Um, and of course, later that same month, the deaths of Arthur Griffith and, and Michael Collins. And so, you know, only a few weeks after, after Cleary's reopens, 
the streets it's closed for today and the streets outside are thronged with thousands um coming to pay their respects for the funeral of michael collins and so it's for me it's this mix between this hope and this optimism and something very practical um but that has a you know a real impact um on so many dubliners um and of course the, the people come up <laughs> to Dublin for the day to do their shopping um but this is all happening still in the midst of conflict um and so you know all of these things are juxt juxtaposed together um, and, you know, for me, that's, that's what's quite interesting is to sort of to look at these continuities um, and just, you know, think about what it might have been like to actually live through that period. I think uh, it's absolutely fascinating, as you, as you mentioned here, and you bring out so eloquently in your essay as well, that juxtaposition of the reopening of theories and then the, the funeral of Michael Collins as well, and, um, you know, competing for space in terms of newspaper attention, but also that central space in the middle of Dublin as well, in which ordinary people are experiencing the highs and the extreme lows of, of ordinary life in, in 1922. Could you speak a little bit about the... Um, you know, what kinds of things are brought out in terms of the kind of print culture, like looking at magazines and so on, what kind of um, ways do they evoke ordinary everyday life? What can we glean from those kind of sources from your own reading? Well, there is just so much. Um, and one of the great things I think is to really look at, um, you know, to not just keyword search um, using online newspapers for this kind of research, because for me, it's the looking at, you know, you find an advertisement is what, what's also on the same page. OK, so you might have, you know, a, you know, the reopening of a shop um, and then the next article, you know, is that. Um, a discussion of assault, discussion of um, um, activities, um, um, ambushes, um, violence. Um, and, you know, people read these papers, you know, they didn't keyword search them and they looked at them all on the same page. Um, and the prominence given to specific things, um, you know, you really get a great sense of it. And what I, you know, it was, so I looked at um, when the paper, magazines I was looking at was Irish Life, um, which gives a sort of... Um, upper class um, view of, of life in Dublin um, at that time. Um, and, you know, it's a really wonderful um, resource um, um, for this whole period. Um, and so it, you know, is full of stuff about, oh, will the Dublin Horse Show go ahead? You know, um, to the anxiety about that, you know, talk about golf and, you know, various other things. Um, and yet, you know, um, you know, the funeral of Michael Collins gets, gets, gets you know, real prominence um, the next month. And even from that, you know, it's this constant moving between are the dark days the past behind us or are we moving, you know, are we moving into something for the future? But then, you know, occasional despair in the sense of state of the world as we are in at the moment. And then, of course, I was looking at other sources like the Irish Homestead, um, which reports quite extensively on the increased cost of living and the difficulty of people affording the basic necessities at the time. Um, and so you're contrasting, you know, the fashion co um, column of Irish life um, with the food prices um, and, you know, the, the challenges that, that other people were facing at the time. Um, and then, of course, you have the wonderful daily newspapers. You know, the, the, um, the, the, one of the images from the, and the chapter is, is a full page advertisement from the Irish Independent um, promoting Cleary's. Um, um, and, you know, um, it's all, but it's also interesting to see that it gets, you know, reported in quite a lot of detail in the Nina news, for example. Um, and so, you know, for me, um, I tend to read periodicals, magazines, newspapers in a sort of run through them. Um, so looking, you know, at each page each day. Um, and it just gives you a sense of, you know, what's happening at that time. Um, you know, a sense of what are people talking about? What might they have discussed over their morning breakfast? Um, you know, what are the, the key sort of issues as they see them at the time? Um, and there's so much that we can we can learn from them and so much wonderful um, visual material um, in them. Absolutely. You brought that to life uh, wonderfully. And, and I think, as you said, we are blessed with digitization, especially in COVID times, of course, that, you know, keyword searches that we're able to find materials online. But of course, there's nothing quite like going through either a, a microfilm run or, or, or an imprint run in the National Library of Ireland of any of these publications. Now, just I suppose to, to bring everyone in, really, what really kind of struck me in terms of your responses was the sense of continuities with previous periods um, uh, and, you know, indeed after 1922. So I suppose as historians, we're most comfortable with periodization. 
and this idea of events happened in a certain row and in, in a certain sequence and so on and and we you know post facto um you know give give uh, weight to certain events um, and i remember Lindsay, if you recall when we were co-teaching in ucd you had put together for one of your classes uh, an alternative chronology of modern ireland uh, in terms of social history and i guess i'm just going to ask you because many of you all of you seem to kind of speak to this idea of that these events and these themes and these people that you're focusing on are, are suggesting that there was an alternative timeline uh, in even in 1922 to the kind of political kind of constitutional dates which we're all brought up to to remember and which and no doubt state will will focus on in terms of their commemorative calendar but can you speak to maybe as a collectively the importance of, of social history and history from below to kind of exploring a different calendar in, in 1922 Lindsay, perhaps you might want to come in on that because you've you've done so much work on this topic. You've outed my you've outed my teaching. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I do remember that, and uh, and students used to be kind of completely disoriented by it because we would have you know, well we'd have things like the flu on it, the opening of the banking crisis, um, the, with first surgery used with anaesthetic, things like that, and 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 it sort of opened up a whole vista, I think, for students, but also for for me. And what I loved about the volume actually. Was the amount of essays that that actually did that for me in this volume that I didn't hadn't even thought about. I think it's it's what it goes back to what Fanula is saying in the sense that that just like our contemporary world, history is full of multiple you know things happening at the same time, things that seem paradoxical but people have no problem holding you know in the same place. So when I say that the woman I focused on didn't seem aware of the political engagements and all the rest of it, I'm sure in another place she was. It just wasn't in this letter, right? So so there's kind of, I think even people have a multiple, a, multiple, a very complex relationship. And it's one also that changes over the course of their lives as well. So one of the things that's interesting about this commemoration is our source material previously had been largely things like memoirs and so on. And increasingly now we have documents that date back from the actual time. And so we get to compare whether people's memoirs memories reflect the same sort of feelings they might have had at the time. So one of the essays in the volume looks at uh, the history of emotions. I think that's um, Quiva uh, and, and Nick David. And she she talks about how emotions played out within the treaty debates. And, and it's interesting because while those emotions are universal, that she's talking about sort of love and hate and so on, they actually they're quite dated in the way they're evoked in the debates. So, so as a modern reader, we would we would find some of the, the kind of images evoked for love and, and, and fear as kind of unsubtle, I suppose, is what we would the way we would look at it. And she sort of tries to understand how those emotions may have been deployed in radicalizing people. And while it's very historically contingent to 1922 in her essay, the idea of emotions radicalizing is very 21st century as well right so i think sometimes it can be it can really help us to see that continuity and change actually you know track track together often and um, in relation to periodization i think that's a really interesting topic as well and it's what always drew me to social history is i always felt i i was able to get under the wire of periodization and 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 um, and, and it's been interesting because this is the very first commemoration that as a historian, primarily a social historian, I've been involved in commemoration because previously I suppose my scholarship wasn't considered to be relevant. So I think that's kind of interesting as well that now I think that the democratization of our education system in general since the 60s and 70s, but also the discipline of history, um, you know, many more people from many diverse backgrounds, not enough, but it's a lot more than it used to be, are now writing history. And so I think we're looking at different source material, we're considering different questions. Um, and even if you think about the notion of gender um, and the idea of using gender as a tool of analysis or a prism through which to explore the past, and I'll end on this and let Fanula and Mary come in, um, that in itself fits no period, okay, because it's it's such a, and look, look, look how, how much has changed in the last decade in terms of even how we understand gender and the body to relate to each other. And yet, certain essays in the volume, like Aidan Beatty's, show how the periods of history do offer us moments, you know, where we can, where the curtains pulled back and where we can see how, what, what was the thinking on gender, as Fanula said, you know, what was the contemporary moment that tell, what does it tell us about gender? So Mary explores sexual violence. Aidan Beatty actually says, this tells us a lot about masculinity and an insecurity about masculinity uh, and so on. So I think the concepts and how emotions and gender also do, don't ally with periodization, but are also can also be very helpfully explored through periodization. If I could just come in um, and there is, um, I think, you know, often the way we look at this period is, you know, we have the sort of, 
decade of centenary sort of approach of, you know, I'd have taken 1912, 1914, or more typically 1916, um, and, and then again up to 1922 or 1923, depending on, on when you went to finish with the Civil War. Um, and and then we so we think about, you know, for example, women's experiences within that period and this period of women active in, you know, doing various things with the with the Republican movement or with the unionists or with suffrage. And then we think about the free state 1920s and 1930s as a culture of containment, women being pushed back into the domestic sphere. And often we treat these as sort of separate um, histories. Um, and often, you know, books are written that end in 1922 as though that's it, you know, um, that's the end of the story in a sense. And then, you know, what's, what follows is something quite different. And I think it's quite interesting to sort of look at it all much broader and to link, you know, what happens afterwards back into this moment and to see the continuities. And I was quite struck in reading Aidan, B Aidan Beatty's chapter when he looks at um, a speech Countess Markovic makes in March 1922 about women's suffrage. Um, and of course, we date 1922 as one of, you know, this is when um, women in Ireland get suffrage and equal rights with, with men, um, unlike what they got in 1918. And often, you know, when I teach this, I talk about this as one of the last progressive pieces of legislation for women until the 1970s. Um, but in, you know, when he analyzes what she actually says about it then, you know, we see that all of these ideas about suffrage and what women should be entitled to are still very much based on restrictive gendered norms of behavior. So this idea that, you know, yes, women did their bit for the revolution and therefore they deserve suffrage because they took on a man's part. Um, and I think that's quite, this is Const Constance Markovic saying all of this. Even she has sort of, in a sense, internalized it all. Um, and so, you know, even this moment that we see as, you know, for, for feminist historians, this is sort of a, a key moment in, in, you know, our timeline of the um, of Ireland in the 20th century. And yet, you know, even it's still, you know, we can see what happens in 1920s, 1930s, um, you know, very much emerging from this sort of rhetoric at the time. Um, so, you know, there's all of these, um, um, in a sense, you know, when we look at it all of it together and we don't sort of, um, you know, see 1922 perhaps as an end point, um, um, but, you know, we can perhaps um, um, see, you know, uh, just um, how little perhaps changes um, or how incremental um, these things can, can, can be. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And it's interesting. I've just finished writing an essay on the decades of centenaries and gender in commemoration. And I, I suppose it became clear to me that it was really difficult to commemorate women in the decades of centenaries because what event do you commemorate other than Countess Markovic getting elected in 1918? But as you say, Fanula, suffrage isn't over. In it, It's not an end point. So there's no real end point to where we can commemorate women and say this is it and then it changes after that we yes commemorating the uh, uh setting up of coming um that's that's an interesting point to start off with or commemorating the women's involvement in the 1913 lockout but women's workers rights are going to continue to be contested and problematic into the irish free state and uh you know somebody like margaret skinneter uh, spends the rest of her life campaigning on women's workers' um, rights and ending up being president of the INTO and campaigning to end the marriage bar, which prevented marriage teacher, married teachers working. Um, and interestingly, I'm, I'm working with Harriet Wheelock at the moment on the Kathleen Lynn uh, diaries, and, and we hope to do a, a selected extracts publication later in this year, early next year, um, with UCD Press. And on January the 10th, Kathleen Lynn wrote in her diary, January the 10th, 1922, two days after the, the vote, she says, not a woman left in the soil. And that really struck me. She recognised that there was no woman TD left in the soil. There was no woman's voice going to be left in the soil because, of course, they're all anti-treaty and they all leave. And there won't be six or more women in the soil until the 1970s, late 1970s, as far as I recall. Um, but she says, but we are stronger and will be stronger for missing the self-seekers. Uh, so, you know, there is that emotion coming in as well. Uh, and her diary gets quite vicious about the, the uh, pro-treaty TDs and Michael Collins particularly. Um, but those emotions that are there about the women and the idea uh, when, when Markovich was leaving uh, as she walked out, having cast her vote against the treaty, um, she called the pro-treaty uh, men oath breakers and cowards. And Collins shouted back, foreigners, Americans and English, of course, getting at Dev and, and Countess Markovich. Um, so I, I found uh, Kuiva's essay on emotions really, really interesting. 
because of course a lot of the talk around the motion and the anti-treaty side was about the women tds and being highly emotional and semi-hysterical and mary mcsweeney giving this hours long speech um uh, um talking about terence and being you know unable to actually deal with this logically and rationally because of course emotion and illogic is connected with women but of course if you look at their speeches yes they mentioned the dead patriots especially the ones they were related to but they're all speaking from an ideological position they have come to themselves so and that continues on into the irish say so how do we commemorate that saying you know political women were developing uh, their own political ideologies. They were working with men that they had uh, a comradeship with for a time. And then uh, once the split came, they were on opposite sides. And I think, you know, coming into the um, uh, commemoration of the Civil War, um, I was annoyed recently with a headline in a newspaper that said, you know, the Brothers War. Um, Recognising that this was Sisters Against Sisters as well. The first uh, uh, organization to meet to discuss the split is coming on, and they do so on the 5th of February. So if you did a, um, a chronology of the War of Independence with what just what the women did, it would be similar in that they're dealing with some of the same things, but some other things would become more important, uh, like suffrage. It doesn't end in 1918. In 1922, in March, Cato Callaghan moves a bill to expand the suffrage to all, all over the age of 21, so younger women can vote in the uh, treaty election in June, which of course Collins and, and Griffith resist. But interestingly, it also reveals a split between the women. Jenny Wise Power refuses to support this because of course she's now in common the Searsha. And so these women are split. Having been united in the cause of women, they're now split on the cause of Ireland or, or the Ireland they imagined. But they will come back together in the free state. Kathleen Clark anti-treaty out, Jenny Wise Power pro-treaty, both senators then in the 1920s and 30s, both absolutely powerful in resisting the misogynistic legislation that's passed the marriage bars and, and the juries acts and the conditions of employment acts and all of those. Uh, and they found both Cosgrave and de Valera similar in their attitude towards women. Uh, and one of the last big battles they all have together is resistance to the 1937 constitution and the women in the home articles. So our periodization of women, one of, uh, years ago I read an article called, did women really have a renaissance? And I think we could write an article, I suppose, between us of what sort of revolutionary period did women really have? Um, and I think it would be very different to what uh, you know, the mainstream narratives or the mainstream narratives, putting on my feminist hat, of the revolutionary period are. And I think that's what's been brought out wonderfully in this decade of, uh, of centenaries and the research that's been done. And, and one more thing I just want to mention is, um, for me uh, personally, doing some research on the same sex female couples of the revolutionary period has been really interesting. And not something, I mean, I'd always heard, known about Elizabeth O'Farrell and Julia Grennan, but through doing research over the last decade on the different women, you know, the 77 women imprisoned in Richmond Barracks, Margaret Skinner, other women uh, in, in different parts of my research, what has become clear is that there was quite a number of female couples or uh, individual women who are either bisexual or in same-sex relationships. And they make a huge contribution to social, cultural, medical, Kathleen Lynn, um, and, um, and Republican, his, or Republican politics. Uh, uh, they're both anti, most of them are anti-treaty actually, um, and cultural histories. Um, and I think that is something we can talk about now much more openly because of the development of gender history, of class history, of the histories of sexualities. And that's really interesting again, and that adds more levels and layers uh, to our, our, our chronologies and our periodization as well. I think that's absolutely um, uh, fascinating, just the, the wealth and diversity of the experiences which are which can now be documented and talked about, as, as you say, Mary, Mary, that Ireland has changed. Ireland 22 is very different, uh, notwithstanding Ireland 19, 19, or 1922. I'm really actually struck by something Michael D. Higgins wrote, um, and of course, being very uh, his interventions have been key in terms of the Machno series and so on, and he mentioned that 
uh, the Irish Revolution can be studied as a multi-layered story, um, one that can be accessed from many different perspectives in an openness to the voices and stories of those who uh, might be constituted as the other. And I think that speaks very powerfully from the head of state to something which is amounting to a revolution in how we think about not only the past but also the present that Ireland is such a much more uh, such a multicultural society today and uh, more liberal and and speaks to the idea of varieties of Irishness to use Roy Foster's term. I was also struck by um, I mean Aidan Beatty's essay has been mentioned and he ends it with such a, a, a clear statement of of intent. He says whether or not 1922 marked the final year of a political revolution, it was not the final year of a sexual revolution. And I think that's such a powerful way to end and certainly echoes the, the very important points you're making. Marie Coleman's essay is very interesting as well. I think she highlights something that you've touched on, this idea that in restoring agency to women during this period, ideological agency specifically, and I suppose we do need to address this issue of women's uh, ideological and political agency having been denuded in the historiography. And um, I suppose most infamously, P.S. O'Hegarty's characterization of women during this period as the Furies, and that they were the kind of the, the kind of root cause, um, the kind of apparent um, you know, uh, hypocrisy uh, and I mean, he uses terms like irrationality, weakness, and so on. Their contribution during the treaty debates, his argument said that this constituted a, a breach in the Irish nationalist movement and led to the civil war. I'd just like each of you, if you'd like to, to kind of maybe respond to that what, almost 100 years later, I suppose, to, uh, to that kind of um, very partisan and very misogynistic interpretation of this period. Uh, Lindsay, I might start with you. He's an easy target, isn't he, P.S. O'Hegarty, with his, his furies? Um, yeah, I mean, I think what's really interesting about that is, is the way in which it was really accepted, although people, you know, felt he was on the extreme and his kind of reading was largely unquestioned for, for a long, long time. And there was no weight placed on on the on the kind of conviction behind those ideological um, um, statements, say for example during the treaty debates, and even as obvious as as Quiva saying, well, if you want to say Mary McSweeney's was emotional, well, so was you know many of the male contributions as well. And what, what and what do we constitute as emotional? And why does the, kind of the evoking of the dead necessarily mean you can't hear what's being said nonetheless? But also the role of evoking the dead was incredibly important, and in fact the use the women's role in propaganda was crucial and 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 their their carrying of the responsibility and the mantle of those who had died in order to raise funds to continue that movement in the 1917 period is the reason why it was able to to continue and of course that gets totally totally right uh, written out i think i i would end my kind of contribution on the quoting one of my favorite historians of commemoration which is rasheen higgins and she says in one of her essays in una frawley's wonderful ethical collection which both Fanula and Mary have essays in on, on, on women and commemoration. She says, it's so ironic that women so often had the job of curating, keeping material, keeping alive narratives, even the narratives of, of men in particular, but also uh, arch artifacts, cultural um, um, kind of evidence of the revolution. And yet oh, then to find themselves expunged is the sort of historical irony. And then one more, the female historian to quote Senya Peseta also points out in her book and that, that was published in, in, in 2013 about nationalist women that so many of these women did not expect to be forgotten and um, so I'll end on that and let Fanula and Mary come in. I think you know the PSO Hegarty thing is it's interesting because it's it's just been such a such a dominant perspective in you know and how people have viewed um, women's role in this period, and you know we, we're so familiar with um, you know Margaret Pierce talking about her dead sons and you know this idea that you know these women are there in their in the widow's weeds or you know just sort of representing um, the dead patriots and so and dismissing you know um, um, them from an ideological perspective perspective and so I think it's really important to sort of restore some of that agency back to them and to you know as you know some of these chapters have shown you know that emotions went high on, on all sides um and you know that you know and women in a sense they were using the tools available as well you know you know what would what would get them you know um people to listen to them and i think you know this is where it's really interesting to to look at this in a slightly um broader comparative perspective 
you know, if you look at, um, you know, widows um, from First World War period, for example, in, in Britain and in the colonies that are uh, protesting about their, their rights to, to um, pensions and to financial support afterwards, you know, they're evoking the dead, you know, they're using similar sort of terminology to fight for what, what they feel is owed to them by the state. Um, and, and this, you know, comes up so often in the military service pensions um, claims as well. And if you look at dependence files, you know, um, a woman writing in the 1930s, you know, um, I'm one of the 1916 women, you know, my husband was killed in the Easter Rising. Um, the other 1916 women are getting such and such. And such. Um, why don't, why am I not, why am I not getting that? Um, and these aren't the, the Kathleen Clark, you know, the well-known women of that time. These are the, the wives of labourers. Um, the women who are really struggling um, in the, the years afterwards. But in a sense, you know, they are using the rhetoric that's available to them, placing themselves in that position um, um, as sort of speakers for the dead, um, you know, re reminding people of the, the um, you know, the sacrifice um, that they feel was, was made for the, for the country. Um, but using that in a sense to also get, you know, um, what they feel is entitled, what they're entitled to and what, what they need from the state. Um, so, you know, I think sometimes it, it can be helpful. Um, I think one that's been very positive about this whole decade of commemorations period has been the way that, um, um, you know, sort of global, transnational, um, international comparatives um, have been taken and um, we've become much more accustomed to sort of, um, you know, altering the scales, as Anne Delaney so eloquently put it. Um, and, you know, I think this, this is evident in this volume as well. Um, and, you know, I think it's just, um, you know, different, we, we can move on from PSO Hegarty to, to, you know, just see a much more nuanced um, um, view of what women, um, how they spoke about um, the treaty um, and their, their actions in that period. Yes, um, earlier today, this morning, I was in Glasnevin Cemetery and I am um, just doing a little bit of filming and I uh, visited the grave of Elizabeth O'Farrell and Julia Grennan and then Countess Markovich and Margaret Skinner all of whom were sanitized in some way. Now, uh, P.S.O. Hegarty may have been constructing the women as furies, but others were sanitizing them and making, diminishing them, uh, making domestic, domesticating them, I think. And, and I think the most uh, obvious example of that was De Valera's oration over the grave of Countess Markievicz when she died. Hannah Gee Skeffington was infuriated that he began to the, this domestication of the militant uh, political uh, amazing activists that the Countess had been. And I mean, lots of people have their issues with Markovich and perhaps she was much too dominant, the only female figure in a lot of the histories for uh, far too long, but we cannot but give her her position in, in Irish revolutionary history. Um, and, and de Valera talks about her as mother. Um, it was not really the best part of herself, um, but he begins that process of, of domesticating her. Uh, and the same with Elizabeth O'Farrell, uh, Nurse O'Farrell. I mean, many people don't know what her first name actually is. She is the nurse who brought out the surrender flag in 1916, uh, not uh, showing the agency she had in negotiating the surrender and then bringing the terms back to Pierce and then going and that famous photograph was taken where her feet and her nose and her, her coat appear. And sometimes they're uh, missing from that photograph. And that's for me symbolic. Uh, in many ways, I know now that that, uh, having done some research, that was not deliberate in its first instance. It was to clean up the photograph, but cleaning up the photograph meant removing the woman or the bits of the woman that were on view. And for me, that's symbolic that the, the inconvenient bits were um, removed or, or insulted. And then the convenient bits, the respectable bits, the women who fitted the norm of respectability that becomes the dominant discourse for women in the Irish Free State are sanitized. So we will get Elizabeth O'Farrell in the history books. Um, and Johanna Shee Skeffington is the great suffragette who, you know, campaigned for the right to vote and it was won in 1918. And then what happens? Or Kathleen Clark. What about her? Uh, an amazing political career in, in the uh, Irish Free State Senate um, uh, and then on until she died, uh, defending the rights of women and the rights of workers. Uh, Nora Connolly O'Brien, another case in point, deserving of a full biography for her activism uh, in the Irish Free State. And many of these women, you know, get marginalised, they're talked about 
in relation to the men they were related to or in relation to, you know, a sanitized version of themselves. And I think the decade of centenaries has really helped with that. And for me, I started the decade of centenaries with campaigning. Um, well, the research started before that, but very obviously campaigning for the Rosie Hackett Bridge in 1913 or 2013 uh, to have it named after her. And there was an ordinary woman fought in 1916, a Jacobs factory worker, uh, a woman who joined the Irish Women's Workers Union and then remained part of the ITGW, ran the sweet shop uh, next door for 50 years. Um, is an amazing story of a, of a young uh, working class inner city dub uh, who achieved, an ordinary woman who did some extraordinary things. Um, and it's ending, so we campaigned for that and we got it done. It's, it's, it's kind of coming to a close on a little bit of a disappointment. For me, the decade went up in terms of, of uh, the representation of women and including women. And nobody, uh, officially or unofficially, is commemorating the uh, common man split on February the 5th, 1922, which I think is vital. So I am holding a symposium uh, with a little bit of funding I got from UCD on the 25th of February this month with four, uh, three other great speakers. And I haven't asked her, but I think Fanula is going to chair. <laughs> I did mention it to her. But uh, the fact that it was forgotten again, the fact that Common Amman are the first militant organization to split and it is not being marked. There was a huge uh, marking of the, the uh, Dublin Castle event and the um, giving over of Dublin Castle to the Irish Free State there last weekend. Fantastic. And that's really important. But we also have to recognize what the women are doing. Uh, that suffrage campaigning is continuing, that women's um, uh, experiences of and uh, contributions to the civil war is not just as furies, not just as 600 of, the, of them uh, arrested and imprisoned, but without them, the anti-treaty campaign could not have happened. And the support that the Cumann and women gave to the Free State and the National Army is very uh, vital as well. And that, that split between the women in part is, is fixed or, or healed because they face a common enemy then in the Irish Free State, a patriarchal theocratic state that comes into being. Um, so I think interesting times ahead for us as well. The decade of centenaries uh, and this sort of research, particularly on women and class, doesn't end now. Uh, we go on into, more in, uh, into much different and I would say much more interesting uh, impacts and legacies. Uh, on into the free state, as uh, you know, uh, everybody here um, has done research on, and it's it's interesting as well. I mean, interesting times ahead, Mary, as you so aptly put it, challenging times ahead. I mean, I thought we'd end our, our discussion with giving each of you an opportunity to maybe think about, you know, future directions. It's in some respects, it's difficult to think beyond the decade of centenaries. It's been so definitive in terms of the public's understanding of this period. And there's almost an element, someone said to me once, you know, invoke Francis Fukuyama, the end of history, you know, did 2022 mark the end of history? And I mean, hopefully not, of course, but from each of your points of view, you've mentioned some of the uh, great successes of the decade of centenaries in terms of digitization, access to sources, Lindsay mentioned education, and of course, restoring these remarkable women um, to, the, to the public record. Um, but if you were to kind of uh, you know, advise uh, going forward or, or to think about, you know, what, how these events should be commemorated going forward, 22, 23, and even beyond, what would you hope the remaining uh, 18 months, shall we say, of the decade of centenaries would look like? Lindsay. Sorry, I have to unmute myself there. Um, I, that's a massive question, I suppose, for me, and it's completely where my interests lie. Um, I would be interested in seeing the sort of state that develops um, and its relationship with its citizens and that kind of the diverse experience of citizenship um, and that mediated through by things like class in particular and power, which are things that get left out a lot. So when we're talking about what kind of experiences people had in order to understand them, we've got to understand this in a broader structural sense as well. So I'd love to see a little bit more of that um, um, and, and contact carry on some of the really great nuance and work that's being done. Um, and indeed the global aspect, which which Dara, you've been so important in, and Fergal and Enda and others, is, is really helpful in that. And Fanula alluded to it too, that you know, keeping Ireland in the context as well of other of other states forming at the time, but also the post-war world, if you like. So that would be my my hope. Fanula, I'll pass the virtual microphone to you. 
Um, yeah, and I, sp I suppose I'm like speaking sort of from, you know, my own personal <laughs> interest here. Um, but, you know, it's, um, I think there's so much interesting work to be done on the sort of um, the legacies of all of this period for, for individuals, for families, um, for, for the, the, the women who, who went through it all. Um, and I say just, you know, not ending the story with, with 1922, but looking at the lasting ramifications that go on for decades. Um, and so, you know, for me, it's not so much about a specific date that we, though I do think we should mark um, the universal suffrage for, for women in 1922. Um, you know, even if people had mixed feelings about it at the time, you know, it is a, an important date in our calendar um, and, um, you know, something that, that was fought long and hard for. Um, but I think, you know, otherwise it's just, you know, there's so much wealth of new source material available to us now, um, most notably the military service pension collection, which is so much um, on in the legacies on people's lives in the decades afterwards. Um, and so, you know, it's it's perhaps looking at some of the material that we have and thinking about it in different ways, um, you know, just thinking new ways of framing the narrative. Um, but, you know, I think one of the really positive things about this whole decade has been um, just, you know, the sort of collaboration and the, the you know, level of just scholarship and the, the um, um, level of engagement and interest um, in it. I mean, so much fascinating work from it all. I think I need a year off to just read all of the books <laughs> that have been published. Um, but I, do, I hope that momentum continues and um, that, you know, women's history continues to be integrated. Um, you know, it's, it seems to be gradually getting more towards the mainstream. Um, we're not just women talking about women's issues to each other, um, but becoming something a bit more general. Um, and I hope that that momentum continues as we move beyond this, this decade of centenaries. Thank you so much. And so say all of us. Uh, Mary, over to you. Yes, I, I suppose there are two, a couple of things. Um, in the immediate term, obviously, um, um, having that symposium on the coming month split and, and what is the impact of that. But uh, um, I'm also very interested, as you know, being from Kerry, um, on, on Kerry in the Civil War and what the Kerry women were doing during the Civil War period, because there is um, a real, um, we have a, a lot of material on the violence that was visited on, on women and not just the famous case like the Kenmare case, but other violences that were done on women. Um, uh, about 30 Kerry women were arrested and sent to Kilmainham and Mount Joy but many dozens others were arrested locally and kept in uh, local jails for between three and five days and what was happening to them there. And we get a lot of material in the um, uh, pension applications uh, and their, their experiences of violence. I'm also very interested in, you know, the, the March and April in Kerry sees some pretty horrendous violence, Bally CD, Cash Milk and Not Nagoshal, and the response of the women Women aren't killed in these uh, incidences, but they are very much impacted by it. Uh, one particular pension application file I was reading was about a woman who, after Bally CD, is uh, with a group of women go and, and pick up the body parts. And one of those bodies is her brother. Um, and she loses her mind and she is never the same again after that. So the impact of both experiences in violence and that indirect experience of violence and how it impacts women, but also the construction of the women, not just by PSO Hegarty, but you see the reports of Kerry Command being set up, sent up to Dublin, and they're talking about these crazy women. Everything would be fine except for the women. The women are the ones who are keeping the anti-treaty campaign going. Um, and that construction, again, of women of dif as difficult as, 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 you know, manly, as, uh, not fully fe female, basically, in their actions and in their politics. And then further on, um, one of the themes I want to continue following on into uh, after the decade is over is sexuality uh, and um, specifically looking at female sexuality and, and women who are involved in same sex couples, not just the political women, uh, but also trying and, and how the sources will reveal things to me I don't know on this because this would be a very women weren't criminalized in terms of their sexuality uh, so very interestingly I have found a couple of you know headstones that indicate that two women are buried there and the uh, uh, um, words on the headstone indicate a relationship they're not related to each other but a relationship between them wills estates 
um, uh, all that sort of thing. So I want to really do a deep dive into uh, female same-sex couples in the 20th century before 1970 and, and second wave feminism and how we write about that. Uh, and there's great work being done by, by um, the Northern Irish Queer Project, Leanne McCormack and Tom Holm, who are talking, who are doing that there. I think, you know, this is a time when that sort of history is flowering and it's so exciting. Um, I'm also very interested in power and how power operates on the female body in the free state going forward um, on, on respectability, on domesticity, on poverty, on uh, and, and uh, Lindsay's um, writing is so important to that, uh, on how women are marginalized through the through the processes of power and politics. Um, so I think I have enough to keep me busy on into retirement, basically. I mean, that sounds fantastic uh, and really, really exciting. So we'll, we'll see you in the National Library, uh, certainly beyond 2023. And I think what all of you have alluded to, of course, is that, well, the commemor commemoration programme may officially end in 2023. The, the research, which is really growing out of this a unique moment in, in kind of historical time, it will, will continue to be published. And, you know, we have a, a great um, generation, really, of early career scholars who are, are writing with renewed vigour and en energy and enthusiasm. Fanula mentioned quite um, appropriately scholars from around the world, um, around the Irish diaspora, who have now got access to sources, uh, even through COVID, you know, I suppose, through Zoom and so on, are now part of this international, transnational conversation. So I certainly would echo all of those really important points that hopefully this discussion will continue, certainly in the academic spaces, and, and bring those um, key interventions into the public uh, realm going forward. It's been my great pleasure to listen to, 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 the, to your insights uh, this afternoon, and I, I'm sure that's been echoed by our, our, our viewers from around the world. And so I'd like again to thank you on behalf of the Department of Foreign Affairs and the Royal Irish Academy, to Lindsay Erna Byrne, to Fanula Walsh, and to Mary McAuliffe for your expert contributions to today's discussion. And uh, uh, I should note again uh, that this uh, St. Bridget's Day event is supported by the Department of Foreign Affairs and the Royal Irish Academy and uh, is brought to you by the RIA in support of the new volume, Ireland 1922, Independence, Partition and Civil War, which is available in all good bookshops and can be purchased online through the link below uh, on this website. So again, thank you all for your attendance and we wish you all a very happy St. Bridget's Day. <laughs>